Hello, and welcome to worship. We are glad that you are here and ready to engage the Spirit. In today's worship, we are given a challenging parable with which to wrestle, essentially asking the question, which is better, to profess our faith and do nothing, or say nothing but live faithfully? What does it mean to serve uh, as a child of God? And once we figure that out, the challenge continues. Are we open and receiving of those who live and act differently than us, yet through their actions are more fully living into God's purpose for their lives? The first step in this process begins with looking within. Does God have ultimate authority on our lives? And if so, do we lead lives that indicate that to be true? If you're feeling a little lost and confused right about now, then you are exactly where you need to be. As we worship and as we hear Pastor Doug preach on this text, I pray that you'll experience the Spirit stirring in you, leading you to deeper relationship with God and with those in your lives. Welcome to worship.
be with you. Let us pray. O God, Lord of all creation, you are so patient with us. We run away and you seek us. We make foolish choices, yet you continue to teach us the better way. We hurt you and others and you forgive us. Help us reveal your glory and goodness in our living, that we will bear the imprint of your Son, Jesus Christ, throughout the world. Today's reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, the 21st chapter. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief of priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons, and he went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said the first. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the, in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In our gospel text today, we find Jesus beginning the last week of his life. Here in Matthew 21, the story we have follows Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. We call it Palm Sunday. Remember, he rode a donkey and the people shouted, Hosanna, which means save us. And they threw palm branches on the ground and he went to the temple, went straight to the temple. And he did what we call the temple cleansing where he flipped over tables and chased out the animals because the people there were taking advantage of the pilgrims who were coming into Jerusalem for the week of Passover, offering their sacrifices, giving their offerings, and, and they were basically charging exorbitant rates and taking advantage of people's piety. That's why he, he cleansed that temple. Well, then he went to Bethany for the evening, Sunday night. Monday morning, he got up and he, he went to Jerusalem. There was a fig tree that didn't have figs, and he cursed that tree, and it died. The disciples didn't understand what it meant. It was a foreshadowing that anything that does not bear fruit for God's reign in the world will go away. That's what that cursing of the tree was about, that a change was coming. We are less than a week away from Jesus' death on Friday and his resurrection. But here, this is Monday. It's Monday morning. He goes into the temple and he began, begins to preach. And, and the leaders of the temple, those same people who had come to him uh, uh, on Sunday after he had cleansed the temple, they come back to him. And they ask this question about authority. Now, authority can be defined in, in different ways. What they're asking is, who authorized you to do what you're doing? What are your credentials, right? If someone were to ask me, by what authority do you preach? By what authority are you a pastor? I can refer to my degrees. I have a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, a doctoral degree. I can refer to my ordination into the ELCA. But that's just paperwork. Those are just letters, right? 
And, and that's one aspect of authority, the authorization that, that they were looking for Jesus to, to articulate. But there's a different kind of authority. There's an authority that comes through how we live our lives. Think of somebody in your life with whom you give authority. You let them tell you the truth. You listen when they speak. They have authority with you, not because they have degrees, not because they have papers. They have authority with you because of how they live their life. They have authority with you because you can trust them. They've demonstrated over and over and over that they're reliable, that they're in your corner, that they believe in you and that they love you, right? That's a different kind of authority. And as I think about Jesus answering the question of authority, what's he going to (laughs) say? We don't know who his teachers were. We don't know where he learned. We, We get no information about who Jesus studied under. He's a rabbi. He's a teacher. He has that title, but we don't know where he learned his trade. We don't know where he was instructed. What if he went and spent time in other parts of the world? What if when he was young, he had traveled to the Far East and studied Eastern religion? I don't know if he did or not. Certainly, there are things we can see in some of his teachings that would align with Buddhism or align with with some aspects of, of Hinduism or or some of the other Eastern religions, Zoroastrian. But we just don't know who his teachers were. So he didn't answer from that direction. He didn't say, well, I studied under so-and-so. He didn't give that answer. But if, if we're talking about authentic authority, the authority that comes from behavior, that comes from being consistent and trustworthy, what's he going to say there to the leaders in the temple? Is he going to say, well, Everything that's alive came into being through me. The whole creation came into being through me. They wouldn't have accepted that. They wouldn't have even understood or begun to understand what he was talking about. We get that in chapter 1 of John. All things came into being through him. Apart from him, not one thing came into being. What came into being through him was life. Well, if he were to recite that to the leaders in the temple, they would have stoned him on the spot. They wouldn't have understood. And so he's not able to answer the question directly. He tells a parable. He tells a parable about two sons, and the father comes to the two sons, and he tells them to go to work. And the one son says, no, I don't want to do it. And the other son says, yes, I will. But the son who said yes doesn't go. He lied to his father. The other son who had said no at first changes his mind. That's the Greek word, metanoia which means repent, right? A repentance, to have our minds changed, to see things differently, to turn and and behave in different ways. That's what's happening here. And so the son that said no originally, he changes his mind. He transforms his thinking. He sees things through a different lens and he goes and does what the father had asked. And Jesus describes this in speaking to the leaders about themselves and about the tax collectors and the prostitutes and the Gentiles and the people who were at the fringe who were listening to his message of life. They were following him. They were being transformed within themselves of how they see the world, how they see themselves in relationship to the world, how they see themselves in relationship to God and everyone else. They were catching this vision that that God had created human beings to participate with God in perpetuating life from generation to generation. That's what eternal life means. It's not about where we go after we die. It's about perpetuating life here in this world from generation to generation because God cares about life. God does everything God can to create and sustain life. That's what's important to God, right? And so Jesus is saying these people who didn't get it, they were contaminated by the world's ways. They were contaminated by the ideas of of summer in and summer out. They've been changed. They've been transformed. And so they're now entering the reign of God. They're seeing the reign of God in their midst. They have the eyes now to recognize it. But those of you speaking to the religious leaders in the temple, 
those of you who still think there's winners and losers, those of you who think that, that your privilege is a gift from God to use for yourself, those of you who think that the goal of life is wealth and power and control, you're so far from the reign of God. You're not even close. You'll never enter it. You'll never see it. You're going to live your whole life without experiencing God's reign of love and life. And, and Jesus is speaking to them really out of a place of compassion. He wants them to be transformed. He wants them to have metanoia, repentance. He wants them to be able to see life and love in their midst and to participate in what it is that God's working to get done in this world. But they refuse. They just won't see it. And they get angry with him. They, they're already trying to figure out how to get rid of this guy. And Thursday night, this is Monday, Thursday night, they're going to arrest him and beat him and, and humiliate him, throw him in prison for the night, have him attend several trials in front of Caiaphas and in front of Herod and in front of Pontius Pilate because they're so angry with this message of love and life. They want power and control to be the way. They want wealth to be the way. They want to believe that God is rewarding them and punishing others. That's what they're trying to hold on to. And that is so far away from God's reign in this world. And so I'm, I'm sure that Jesus is there with a broken heart. I'm sure he's there grieving that these people who were educated, these people who were religious leaders should have known better. They should have been able to be the first ones who recognized what God's doing in the world, but all of their stuff got in the way. We know the story that after Jesus dies, on the third day he's raised from the dead. That's where he gets his authority. He does what he said he was going to do. He said that he would go to Jerusalem and be crucified and then raised. And what's happening in that resurrection is life and love win. That's what's happening. When, when God raised the Christ from the dead, it wasn't just the resuscitation of a dead man. It was a promise that life and love break into every dark place in our world. That life and love will win, not necessarily on our timetable. Not necessarily when we want it or as quickly as we want it. But it's coming because throughout the course of history, not just human history, the course of the history of the universe, God has been building justice. God has been building life. God has been building love. Love is the tool for how God builds life. And it's been consistent throughout. And the resurrection of Christ is more of the same. Where death and, and violence happen, God will bring new life into the midst of that. We've seen that here in our community. We've been through a lot of adversity and challenges from school violence to teen suicide. But I have story after story after story about how God breaks into those times of pain and anguish and fear and death and generates new life. Not the kind we can predict, not the kind that we can schedule, but it comes. And we're called to have eyes and, and hearts that can see and recognize when God is breaking into this world. We're called to be people who trust the authority of Jesus, trust the authority of the Christ, that God will come through, especially in those really painful and difficult moments. And it's really hard to do alone. We, we need community to do this. We need community to come around us and to walk with us. And we're called to have authority. Authority in our homes, authority in our workplaces, authority in our schools and in our neighborhoods, authority that comes through how we live our lives, how we're pouring ourselves out for the sake of the world. And that's what comes through in our uh, passage this morning from Philippians chapter 2. So let me, let me read that again. I know you just heard it, but I want to read it again. And, and if you're looking for building authority in your life. This is the way you do it. And this part of the St. Paul wrote this, and, and we believe that part of this is a hymn. It was a song that they would have sung during worship to remind themselves who the Christ is and to remind themselves who they're called to be in the world. 
So let me just read this again. Philippians chapter 2. If then there isn't any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, right? If we're ever consoled by love, any sharing in the Spirit, that means participating in, in what God is doing in the world, any compassion and sympathy. You hear these? Having compassion and sympathy. When we, when we encounter each other and when we disagree with each other, we're called to treat the other with compassion and sympathy. Sometimes people just don't know. Maybe they've never experienced love. Maybe they've never experienced inclusion. Maybe they've never been respected or, or treated as an equal. Maybe they were raised in a, in a home where you were taught to win at all costs. You were taught to be dominant. Violence is okay as long as you win, right? And so as we encounter others and we, we work to, to live out of our own authority in love, it starts with compassion. It starts with gentleness. As I've been saying, we don't just see people. We're called to see into people and recognize they just don't know. What did Jesus say on the cross? Forgive them. They don't know. They don't know. They don't know another way than violence, than domination, than war. They, they just don't know. So we lead with compassion and sympathy. And then he says this, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. In other words, we're, we're called to love each other in ways that generate love. So that we're, we're, we're creating love within our systems of family, school, work, neighborhood. We're creating love within our congregational system. So that anytime we, we disagree, anytime we have adversity, anytime somebody is, is going through anguish or pain, we respond with love. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Jesus never did anything out of selfish ambition or conceit. He never used his abilities, his powers for himself. When he was hungry in the wilderness, he didn't turn the rocks into bread for himself. He didn't use his powers for that. But he fed the hungry. He didn't heal himself when he was wounded and dying, but he healed others. And it was God who raised him from the dead. He didn't do that for himself, but that wasn't just to resuscitate him after he died. That was to reveal that love and life win. It was to launch a new creation based in love. That's why he was raised. In humility, regard others as better than yourselves. Find the good in other people. It's easy to point out the, 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 the sticks in their eyes, right? Jesus says, before you remove the, the speck in someone's eye, take the log out of your own. But look, at, look for the good in people. They're children of God. Good's in there. Blessing is in there. We're called to look past the, the wrong, look past the bad, to see the child of God that's in there. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. We don't, we're not in life to just take care of ourselves. We're in life to care for the world. We're in life to raise up a next generation that's going to love and that's going to perpetuate life. If it's simply about ourselves, we create a world that's divided where we're at each other's throats, a world that's divided that, that we have to win and conquer and get ours, right? No, St. Paul is saying, no, 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 you're not here for you. You're here to pour you out for the sake of the world. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. See like Jesus, think like Jesus, feel like like Jesus, act like Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, this is that him, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. The leaders in the temple thought because of their high positions in authority, in religion, God stuff, that they could use their positions for exploitation. They could use their positions for self-gain. Jesus never did that but emptied himself, emptied himself, poured it all out, held nothing back. Every gift he had, every ability he had, he poured it out for the sake of others. Taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself 
and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. There's nothing that would get in the way of Jesus serving God. There's nothing that would get in the way of him pouring himself out. That's why he has authority with us. He does what he says he's going to do. He comes through. He holds nothing back. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth. I had somebody ask me recently, you know, is, will Satan go to heaven? <laughs> will Satan go to heaven? Well, it says right here in Philippians, every knee shall bow at the name of Jesus. Every knee. That means demons. That means Satan, however you believe these things. There's nothing that won't bow to the name of the Christ because it's through the Christ that all things came into being. Nothing exists apart from the Christ. He is sovereign. He is everything. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Work out your own salvation. Work out your own salvation. If I say to you, work out your body, you know what that means. You're going to go to the gym or you're going to go for a jog or a hike. You're going to ride a bike. We know how to work out our bodies. Well, work out your salvation. That doesn't mean you're doing work to get saved. You're already saved. You're part of God. You've never, ever existed apart from God. You dwell in God and God dwells in you. Salvation means to be made whole, to be made complete. And now that you live in this awareness that you're a part of God and that God's a part of you, what St. Paul is saying is put that to work. Put that to work in how you live your life. Don't build division, build bridges. Don't use all of your resources only for yourself. Use them for the sake of the world. Find ways of, of living generously, whether you give the money to here to the church or, or to an organization that you believe in, how you use your time, your energy, your education. But what, what Paul is telling us is we have a responsibility. And if we want to have authority in the world, we've got to live this stuff. It's not enough simply to believe it. You've got to live it. You've got to be the child of God you're created to be. You got to be the hard hands and feet of Jesus. You have to be willing to forgive. You have to be willing to show compassion. You have to be willing to help the stranger. You have to be willing to raise up the downtrodden. You have to be willing to welcome the outcast. You have to be willing to include all people. Or else we don't have authority. And if people look at us and say, there's a Christian who doesn't live as a Christian, the whole church loses authority. I think it was Gandhi who said, I would happily be a follower of Jesus if I only saw his followers living the way he did. Well, that's judgment. And it's justified judgment. How often do young people refer to those of us in the church as hypocrites? That we say one thing, but we do another. We act like we're, we love everybody, but we exclude and, and ridicule and put others down who don't think like we do or act like we do, or look like we do. And so this message today is critically important to who we are as followers of Jesus Christ. We might have authority based on paper, based on degrees, based on authorization, but that's not true authority. True authority comes by how we live our lives, by how people experience us. Are people looking at you with authority? When others look at you, do they see someone who is trustworthy and consistent in how you live? Do they see someone who follows through on his promises or her promises? Do they see someone who is willing to pour themselves out, to make sacrifices for self in order to be a blessing in the lives of others? This is serious stuff, and it's for this that Jesus gave his life. My prayer for each of us is that we spend some time this week contemplating on authority and the authority we have in our lives 
Maybe up till now you've messed up. Maybe up till now you've, you, you've not been that person that you believe you're called to be. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. You get to change. You get to have a new mind. You get to repent. You get to see with new eyes and feel with a new heart. Let today be the first day of your transformation, of you taking seriously what it means to live as a child of God. Because then, and only then, do we get to see and experience and participate in God's reign in this world. God loves each of you, and I do too. Amen. With humble hearts, we come before God to release and be released, to receive and be filled. Merciful God, let your church be a place of refuge for all. Help us to forgive each other, practice patience, and choose welcome. Remind us that each person is made in your image. 
Release us from the desire to control or contain you, and instead, fill us with your life-giving spirit. We release and receive. Renewing God, forgive the harm we have caused to our planet and her people. Teach us to be better stewards of the water, land, and air, and better caretakers of one another. Turn our hearts towards the needs of the poor and vulnerable. We pray especially for those living with chronic pain, mental illness, the disease of addiction. Free us from judgment and fill us with compassion. We release and receive. Healing God, help us to slow down our busy lives so we see those around us who are in need. Let us always be seeking out how to serve one another, especially those who are lonely, ill, suffering, and feeling hopeless or forgotten. Fill us with your spirit of compassion to share your peace and comfort with them. Give us hearts that serve out of gratitude and generosity so that all may experience your love. We lift up to you now those that are on our hearts. We release and receive. Receive our prayers and fill us, God, with your creative and life-giving spirit, now and forever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. We now invite you into this time of peace, and this is a great opportunity to connect with those in your lives, not just to say hello, but to be intentional about welcoming the peace of the Spirit, God's peace, into their lives and into your relationship together. As we share communion together, this meal is intended to remind us that we are a part of God, and that we're a part of God's story in the world. It's a meal of inclusion. It's a meal that's for all people. No one is to be left out. And it's to fill us with the spirit of life, the spirit of love, the spirit of of goodwill toward all people so that we can live that in our lives, live as people of authority, not because of, of the letters we might have behind our names, but because people experience love through us. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. As God's family, we pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. As I was saying, Prior to starting communion, this feast is for all people. It's not just for some. It's not just for the religious. It's not just for those who have attended a class or have achieved a certain age. It's a sign. It's a witness to God's vision for this world. And so everyone present is invited to participate. If you're watching this alone, let me offer the words for you. The body of Christ given for you the blood of Christ shed for you. Come and eat, for the gifts of God are free.
body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you. You are always in God's grace. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs>